I almost left him. I had my niece go, and I said, Jessica, your one job is to make sure I don't lose Levi. I had 34, 35 people on the trip with me that I was responsible for and my son. So I brought my niece along and said, that's your role. We were leaving one of the villages we'd been sharing the gospel at. And I go, all right, let's go. And, and Jessica goes, Doug, where's Levi? I went, Levi. No answer. I'm like, okay, listen, everybody on the bus, we got to get our story straight, okay? So we, the, a couple of us college students, we jump off the bus. There's two other college students missing. We start going down this village, down the road, screaming for them. Can't find them. The bus pull, just gets out of the way of somebody and pulls around a corner. And as it pulls around the corner, we see our people, three, three people in our shirts, and we see them about half a mile down the road. And what had happened was, as we were driving in, there were some construction workers working on the road, and Levi said, I'm going to tell them about Jesus. So they walked down to tell them about Jesus, and they led four of those men to Christ as he shared the gospel. That's Levi. Okay? Lane is my second child. Lane's going to start a prison ministry from the inside. Okay? I love watching Lane's heart. He is the sweetest kid. He, he, he's one of these kids that just, he just always wants to, people to notice him. And, and he is so much fun to be around. About, about, I guess it was December, he came up to me and he said, Daddy, I need a fire pit. Now, what that means in our ham family is real simple. The fire pit is where we go to talk serious. And, and boy, my boys know that. And he's like, Daddy, I need a fire pit. And I'm thinking, you're seven. What have you done? And um, so we went out, and I made the fire pit. And Levi saw the fire pit going on, so he comes out. And I love Levi's heart. He came out with s'mores because he didn't know what was going on. But he was scared for his brother. So um, he came out, and we, we, we started. And I said, Levi, we'll do s'mores in about 15, 20 minutes. Lane and I need to talk. So the fire's going. And I can see inside, and I see my wife. She knows what's going on, and she and Levi begin to pray. And, and Lane prayed to receive Christ that night at the fire pit. And um, it was a cool thing. Matter of fact, I'll be home in two weeks on a Sunday. It'll be my first Sunday since that's happened. We're going to actually see him walk the aisle. And then the next week, I took the next weekend off as well just to be able to baptize him. So I'm going to baptize my son hopefully in the next couple of weeks. So I'm excited about that. But my family is very vital to my role in what I do ministry. With that being said, my wife was in town with Levi. I was home with Lane, and, and I was hanging out in the house, and it was the spring, all the doors were open, the windows were open. I was drinking a glass of tea, just kind of watching the baseball game, just enjoying life. Lane, time for his nap, so I put him down for a nap. <laughs> come back and I sit in my chair and I decide I need to refill a tea. It's a commercial break and I walk into the kitchen and what I think is a toy snake is in the middle of the floor. It turned and looked at me. I was not a happy camper. I didn't know what to do. I, think about it. How do you get a snake out of your house? Do you walk up to it going, come here, come here. Come here, boy. I'm not touching it. I can tell you that right now. It's, I'm not going to walk in there and just grab it right behind. No! That tail will hit me. What if it's poisonous? You don't know that. You don't know if that tail's poisonous and on that snake. It may have been a unique snake, okay? So I decide i got to do something. So I start thinking and processing. I can't shoot it because apparently my wife doesn't want holes in the house. I don't know what to do. My, the phone rings, which was the timing was awful because I'm kind of leaning over trying to figure out what to do, and the phone rings. Oh, yeah. I'm not going to lie. I jumped up a little bit, and I got up there, and I'm thinking, okay, so I find, and adults, you'll appreciate this. Y'all remember the dowel rods you used to hold your windows up? Y'all are like, uh, yeah, you're with me? I had a dowel rod, because our house is an old farmhouse, and we'd open one window, and it would just slam shut. So we had the little rod, so I grab it, and I lay it on the snake, and I stand on the other end. And I grab my knife out of my pocket, I'm thinking, I'm going to cut your head off. You will be dead here. And I start walking up to it. So I take my knife and I lean over. And as soon as I get close to it, the tail hits my arm. Uh -uh. No, I was not a fan at all. I do it again. I'm thinking i got to end this. So not thinking about the, the, the floor, I grab my knife and it just... And the head falls off that snake. And that snake's head was still moving. 
and the body you can't tell me that's of God and it's just sitting there ah, no so then I realized something my wife is on her way home I've got to get rid of the snake so I grabbed some paper towels not that thick so I don't have to actually touch the thing I grab them and I scoop it up and I get it outside and I throw it right out in the field I walk back in and there's a gash in the linoleum about like that I wash the blood up that's in it and think I've got I don't know so I'm, I'm getting it dirty I'm stomping on it doing everything I can to make it look like it's been there that night my wife was cooking and she goes Doug so I did the yes baby I love you Amy she said what happened to the floor right here now I didn't lie but I didn't tell her what happened all I said was this right here those boys and their hot wheels automatically assumed they had done it the hot wheels were taken away for a week and my boys still don't know why but you didn't save me you see it's amazing how things startle us in life and change the way we act in Genesis chapter 3 there's a major change that takes place and in chapter 3 verse 1 it says now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made he said to the woman did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden wait a minute I don't know if you've ever questioned this the snake talked. did you get that if you walk out to your house and there's a rattlesnake in the yard and it goes hey been waiting for you I'm not going to answer it with a, well, it's good to see you too. I'm going to answer it with a gunshot wound. But understand, the snake talked back to, and here's what happens to Eve. Now, women, I'm not saying y'all are crazy by any stretch of the imagination. Although there are times. Eve, the woman said, she responds. That's not right. Y'all ever done something and thought, that was the craziest thing I've ever done in my life? How many of y'all talk in your car to yourself? Anybody? I drove in Dallas traffic yesterday for a few minutes. I talked to myself repeatedly. And the whole time it was, don't die, don't run into him. Don't die, don't run into him. Because people would just come flying up and then cut me off in front of me. And I'm sitting here thinking, in Arkansas, I would have hit you. I would have made sure, but I'm out of state and I don't want to cause that problem right now. But people, I'm just telling you, Texas, y'all drive crazy. Y'all got construction right out here. Y'all know that, right? Slow down in construction zones. But I'm driving, and, and I'm white-knuckling. I'm tensed up. I had to take blood pressure medicine going to Dallas and coming back. But I get up there, and I think about it, and, and I'm looking, and, and this woman is, is talking to a serpent, and this is what she says. She says, we may eat any from the fruit of any tree in the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said you must not eat it or touch it or you will die. Make sure you understand. She knew the rules. If you eat it and touch it, what happens? You die. It's not, that wasn't a secret. Y'all ever got onto your kids for something and they're like, I didn't even know we're not supposed to do that. It should be common sense. My brother and I had BB guns. And my brother dared me. He said, I bet your BB gun won't break a window. I said, I bet it will. He's five years older than me, a lot smarter than I am. He said, shoot that window then. Okay, we're in the house. So I shoot the window, and it puts a hole in the window. So I do what any young man would do. I duct tape it. And I draw a picture on it like I made a design, and I wanted to display it. When it got cold and it, that breeze started blowing through the house, Dad started realizing there's something wrong I found out why you don't shoot the BB gun in the house through a window because he didn't want you to but he didn't say that he, he didn't hand me the gun and go son don't shoot this in the house it's common sense right you would think so but nowadays I'll be honest with you when I work with teenagers they need you to spell it out for them they don't get it sometimes well guess what Eve had it spelled out for. Touch it, eat it. If you do either one of those things, what's going to happen to you? Let me ask you, church, 
You ever listen to the wrong voice? You ever listen to that voice that tells you to do something you know is wrong, but you do it anyway? You see, we have a society that's bombarded with the wrong voice. The voice of God is powerful, but the voice of society is loud. And it seems like the loudest always wins. Eve is listening to the wrong voice. We've all been there. Verse 4, the voice talks to her, the serpent says, no, you won't die. Verse 5, in fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened, like, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Then the woman saw the tree was good for food and delightful to look at, and it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of it, and, of its fruit, and, well, i got, I got to stop there. You know what she did? When you listen to the wrong voice, you ready for this? You justify what you're doing. You ever justified something you knew was wrong? You do. You justify it because if you can justify it in your own eyes, you don't feel guilty about it. Folks, let me tell you something. Guilt doesn't from, come from God. Understand this. Godly sorrow is what the Holy Spirit gives you. Godly sorrow wants you to change. Guilt wants you to stay feeling guilty because you won't function when you stay feeling guilty. You see, God's called you and purified you you are free from guilt. Godly sorrow is saying, you know what? I've messed up. It's time I do better and turn from my sin and repent. There's a big difference. But you see, we listen to the wrong voice and then we justify it. I justify things all the time. I, I, I was telling her, I'm supposed to be on the diet. I'm supposed to be on the diet for about 10 years now. And I've decided that diet is just die with a T on the end of it. That's all it is. My, I changed doctors. Let me tell you why I changed doctors. I went into his office, and I, he left the room, and my chart was there, and I opened my chart, and he had the audacity to write obese on my chart. So he walked in, and I said, you want to tell me why you wrote obese on my chart? And he said, well, you're fat. And here's a good, he's a friend of mine. I said, you couldn't write something like Chunky, Santa Claus like. You couldn't just, just make me feel good about myself because, I mean, I'm, dude, I, I'm allergic to food. It makes me swell. It's not my fault. And we went through, and so I just changed doctors. And my other doctor is a good friend of mine too, but, but he's very blunt. So I walked in, I got on the scale, I got on the scale, he walked in, he said, hey, you're fat. I was like, hey, I know. He said, quit eating out so much. Quit eating fast food. No. He's like, why not? I said, it's good. And I said, dude, I eat with people all the time, and I don't want them to think they have a problem. So if I've eaten lunch and somebody asks me to go to lunch, I want to eat with them. I don't, want they, they're not, I don't want them to be addicted to food. So I'll suffer the consequences, and I'll eat extra meals if that's what it takes. It's like I buy Girl Scout cookies just because I don't want to reject those young ladies. I eat apple pies at McDonald's because they ask me if I want one. Imagine how many times they get told no. Can you imagine working at McDonald's and you're that person and you're like, would you like an apple pie with that? I didn't ask for an apple pie, did I? No, I feel sorry for them. Would you like it? Sure. Of course, add it. Because I don't want to give them rejection. See, I like food. It's a hobby. Some of y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. Don't act like you don't. Now, understand, I know what I'm supposed to do, but I don't do it. Eve knew what she was supposed to do, and she didn't do it. Church, that's how we live our lives today. We know what we're supposed to do, and we listen to the wrong voices, so therefore we don't do what we're supposed to do that's right. If you listen to the wrong voice, you're going to make the wrong choice. Plain and simple. If you listen to the wrong voice, you're going to make the wrong choice. You're going to justify that choice somehow. You're going to make it sound like it's okay, but it's not okay. We can justify anything in our culture today, and nobody's ever going to call you out on it because everybody's trying to justify their own sin. Hey, folks, this should be your book to know how to live your life. The problem is we don't know it anymore. Let me ask you a question. If you had to quote one verse of scripture, reference and the verse, for every year that you've been saved, could you do it? 
and you're telling me you're listening to the right voices when you don't even know the voice of God that he's written for you. We've got to be people who listen to the right voice. We've got to be people who make a stand. I was a youth pastor for 10 years, and one of the things I did one night was we had a pizza pig out. And it was just for my students. I told them not to invite anybody. I said, I promise you there'll be enough pizza you can eat till you are sick. I had football players show up that Sunday morning going, we still eating pizza tonight? I said, we are there. I'm not eating lunch. I said, I challenge you to how many pieces you can eat. Said, okay, Doug, it's on. All these guys are, I mean, they're working, they're training, they're ready to eat. And they show up, and I had, I'm there, I probably ordered 40 to 50 pizzas that night. They were stacked high. The gym smelled wonderful. They walked in, and I said, okay, guys, here's the deal. You get one piece of pizza for every verse of Scripture you can quote. They're like, that's stupid. I'm like, just try it. Let's go. But you can't quote John 3, 16 or Genesis 1, 1. Well, ninth grade girl loved Jesus. Knew her Bible. She got to that table and that pizza and she started quoting Scripture. She got two large pizzas. And all these football players, give me a piece. She started selling them for a dollar a slice. I just walked up to her and said, you know you got a tithe on that, right? You see, we don't know God's word anymore. So how can we know his voice? Plain and simple. We come to church and, and we listen, but, but throughout the week we don't do anything with it. We don't know God's word. We don't listen to his voice. And then here's what happened. Look what happened. Then Eve went up, she took some fruit, ate it, and she also gave it to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Men, you are the spiritual leader of the home. Act like it. Lead your family in prayer. Be men who stand up for what is right and quit watching shows that you know you shouldn't watch. Don't clear your internet history. Be a man of integrity and character and stand up for truth and lead your family let me tell you something we have enough men who are cowards we need real men to stand up and say you know what my my family's not going to go down a path they don't need to go down i'm fighting for them because they're worth fighting for and i'm going to stand up for the truth but i'm going to make sure i'm hearing the voice of god before i expect them to hear the voice of god men this time you hear the voice of god it's time you stand up because you know what? If we would have had a man's man, if we would have had a man who loved Christ with all his heart, who loved God, who loved walking with him, when that snake started talking to Eve, you know what he would have done? He would have crushed that snake. Me and it's time we step up and lead our families. I say it to me just as I'm saying it to you. this point in time, verse 7, it says the eyes of both of them were open and they knew they were naked and they sewed big leaves together and, and made loincloths for themselves. All of a sudden it, it hits them. Uh-oh. Something's different. And, and all of a sudden the realization that they are, are not perfect anymore. And the voice of the outside world tells us some things. It tells us we have to look a certain way, act a certain way, and live a certain way for anyone to like us. When I was in kindergarten, age of five, I'll just, uh, uh, it kind of pains me to say this, but if I'd have been an inch shorter, I'd have been a complete circle. I was as wide as I was tall. I was dating little Debbie. And um, here's the thing. I get up there and... and I loved food, and I still do, but, but there's some things that happen in kindergarten that are pretty in interesting. You may not know this about me, and I, this may be news to you, and it'll be a shocker, I know. I have ADD in high definition, okay? It's not your normal ADD, and everybody around me knows that. Matter of fact, it, it's so bad. I took a picture on the way here. My car hit 200,000 miles on it, my, just to let you know. I drive the sweetest 2007 minivan you will ever see, okay? And I make it look good. Just know that, okay? It can store a lot of snacks. In there. All right, now, I hit 200,000 miles, so I take a picture while I'm driving, 70 miles per hour. 
and all of a sudden people are on my Facebook page going, Doug, control your ADD. You don't need to be taking, but I can, I, I can multitask, I can do that. So I'm driving, I do all that. Well, I've got ADD and HD in kindergarten. I have dyslexia, and I had a speech impediment. How do I know I had a speech impediment? My parents recorded me. Tell me that's not love. They would dress me up in a velour, red velour, little cowboy outfit. I would come out when their friends came over, and I would sing the song like a rhinestone cowboy. But it sounded like, like a twine tone cowboy sliding out on a horse in a tall tangled rodeo. So make sure you understand that I'm chunky but funky. I can't read. I have this, I mean, there's all dyslexia. I've got um, a speech impediment. And then halfway through the year, my teacher looks at me and she has messed with me all year long. And let me tell you what she did. When I got in trouble every day, she put my name on the board. How awesome was that? My name's on the board. It's in lights as far as I'm concerned. And then when I got in trouble again, you know what she put next to it? A check mark. Well, that just messes with my brain because a check mark on a paper is good. I've got my name on the board and a check mark. Apparently, if you get three check marks, you go to someone in the school who lied to you. There's a man standing in front of me the first day of school, and he said, Students, I want to be your prince of pal. The last three letters of my name are pal and uh, my title, and I want to be your pal this year. Uh-uh, he wasn't my pal. I'll tell you right now, he palled me, but he wasn't my pal. Because when you get three checks, you go see him. He's not happy. So I went through that, and they told me that year. They said, Doug, we want to put you in a special class. I'm like, y'all got it right. Mm -hmm. I go to lunch that first day, and I walk out to the little outbuilding it was in, and, and I stand in line with some other people. I'm thinking, huh, this is a little different than I anticipated. I walk in and realize there were more special people in my school than I thought. So I walk in, and they have me in this special needs class. So I went, and for the next two or three years, I would go half a day mainstream, and they would finally move me out. Well, they didn't know what to do with me. Hyperactive kid can't see what I see words backwards. They didn't know how to diagnose all that. I mean, the only riddling I knew in adults, you'll, you'll appreciate this, was my daddy's belt. Because they would send a note home and they'd pin it to my shirt, and my ADD would not allow me to take it off because I'd be like, Dude, that needs a butterfly. And, and I would miss it. Okay, so I just couldn't, I couldn't get it. So I, I, my daddy would whip me. Some days he'd whip me when I'd get up just because he knew yeah, I'm going to be tired when I get home and start working tonight, son. I'm going to whip you because you're going to do something stupid today, right? I'm like, uh-huh. So it just happened. Well, I went through school, and, and I got up to um, high school. My junior year, I had some neat things happening in my life with my baseball stuff and, and love baseball. Baseball was one of, the, one of the gods I placed in front of God. I admit that. It became an idol to me, but baseball was going really good for me. Things were happening. Some D1 schools had contacted me, and, and th just things were really good. Well, they told me I needed to take the ACT. I thought it was an acting class. It's not. It's an academic achievement test. If you have dyslexia and ADD and they give you circles to fill in, that's just mean. I made butterflies. I mean, I got bored, took the test. My brother's brilliant. He's five years older than me. He made a, he made a 28, 29. He, I mean, he's smart. I got up there and my test score came in and my mama opened my test score and a little tear wells up and I'm thinking that's right I am the smart one um, I grabbed the paper from her and I went mom I made a 31 she goes son that's a 13 I was like oh that's not good is it in the math section I made a 4 you get a 3 for putting your name on it and I remember thinking this is not going well for me at all so I went to the school counselor because apparently if you make that score, they call you in. So I went to the school counselor, and she sat me down, and she pulled my little file out. It's pretty thick. I'm not going to lie. She pulled it out. She said, Doug, and listen, um, we should have never taken you out of special needs classes. You probably will never function in society very well. You, you're, you, you Academically, you just won't be able to do it. Now, I'll just tell you right now, academically, I struggled all the way through high school. 
but when that when she told me that man that voice of her saying it I mean I can hear it and, and when she told me that I remember I mean honestly I wanted to hurt that individual because I knew I was not worthless but there was a voice telling me I was so I had to make a decision so I went to my locker it was class was going on I went to my locker and I opened my locker to put some stuff up she'd given me and when, when my locker opened the, the FCA girls huddle would take index cards and they would write scripture on them so they had shoved one in my locker that day and I opened that locker and at my feet was an orange index card and I remember thinking I know exactly what that is and I don't even want to look at it and I picked it up and it was Philippians 4.13 I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. At the age of 16, as I stood at my locker, feeling totally defeated, my God just swooped down and said, I've got your back. I love you. Stay with me. Picked ACT six months later. I had 26 on it. I never took it again because I figured it was a typo. Adam and Eve all of a sudden feel like failures. They've listened to the wrong voice. They've made the wrong choice. So, so what happens is in the cool of the evening, God begins to come walking again. He wants to walk with them. And they hide. You ever hidden from, from God when you've done something wrong? Y'all remember as a kid, you'd hide when you did something wrong. Your parents could find you. How, my parents knew everything I ever did. I don't know how. I still, as a parent, I still, I mean, I, I kind of know how because we, as parents, you see, it's a, you know a lot more than you let on sometimes. And I do that with my kids. I call them out only when I need to. I don't want them to know my sources. But you ever hide from your parents and exactly what Adam and Eve are doing, they're hiding from God because they know they've done something wrong and they feel worthless. I've been there. I've made mistakes. I've done things that hurt people and I felt worthless. Like I didn't belong anymore. Like I didn't fit. Like I didn't have any hope. And then God comes to Adam. He says, Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? In other words, Adam, I want to spend time with you. Where are you? Don't hide from me. I love you. Where are you? And today, regardless of what you've done regardless of where you've been regardless of what you feel your worth is my God is looking at you to go and he's saying where are you I want to use you again I want to take you further than you've ever gone I want to do things with you that you can't imagine one of my favorite things that someone told me was this you can never out dream God dream big and we've got a society that we only dream of the now Folks, I've got big dreams for the ministry I get to work in. And I'm going to tell you, I don't know if they'll ever come true, but I'm going to work as if they're going to. Because I want to serve my God. You know what? I listen to the wrong voice a lot. Maybe you do too. Today I want to challenge you to do something. Listen to the voice of God. Listen to the voice of God and, and be ready to hear and answer when He says, where are you? Because a lot of you are hiding from God. Pastor, maybe we should put a, a time clock in the back so people can just punch in and give God their hour. Some are like, well, that's just rude. You don't need to be like that. No, folks, I'll just show you what, I, what I'm upset about more than anything today. I'm not mad. I'm just upset and frustrated about this. Are right you ready? We live in a free country to tell people about Jesus. We have the opportunity to read our scriptures every day, and we don't take it. Because we're so consumed with everything else. And in Sunday mornings, we expect in one hour to get what we need. Would you eat one day a week? Spiritually, you don't need to eat one day a week. You need to be in the Word listening to the voice of God. I close with this illustration. I'm driving home. It's Valentine's Day today. I hope to get home. There's sleet and freezing rain falling at my house right now. But I'm heading that way. 
I want you to think about something for a minute. Suppose my wife calls me and says, it's Valentine's Day. What would you like to eat tonight? And I say, sweet thing, I want homemade fried chicken. I want some mashed potatoes. I want some cat head homemade biscuits. I want some gravy. I want some purple whole peas. And for dessert, I want homemade apple dumplings. My wife looks at me and goes, you got it, baby. I love you. I can't wait to see you. I said, I'll be home at 7 o'clock. I'm driving along, and about 6.30, I get a phone call. Doug, hey, we, we're going to play racquetball. You want to come play? I said, what time are you all playing? We're playing at 7. Well, yeah, I want to play. So I show up and play racquetball and get home about 8.30, 8.45, and I walk in the door, and I didn't call. I didn't tell her I wasn't coming, and the food's still out on the table. And I look at her, and I walk in and go, oh, Sweetie, I'm so sorry. I love you. Listen, listen, I really want this meal. Would you make it tomorrow night? Same thing. Make it and I'll be home. I promise I'll be home. Well, about 5 o'clock, I'm heading home. I get a phone call. Hey, Doug, there's a, there's a golf scramble tonight. And we're, we're, we're using the glow and dark golf balls. They've got, and, and one of our courses do that. And, and they said, do you want to play? We need a fourth. I'm like, well, yeah, yeah. What time? Got? Come on right now. Just come come by the by the club and, and get your, your your sticks and we'll play. I'm like, okay, yeah, I'll be there. So I go play golf and I don't get home until about 9 o'clock. Now, there's a meal. I walk in and a meal's waiting on me. Kids have eaten. It's sitting out on the table. My wife's sitting at the table waiting. I walk in and I go, oh, I am so sorry. Baby, if you'll make it one more time. Now, women, how many of y'all, be honest, how many of y'all would not have changed your locks already? I would have walked into some of your homes and you would have had chicken flying at my head. Let me ask you this question. How many times have you left God sitting at the table?